Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountain, through the big veil Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee Promise me Good morning, church. Welcome to our worship this morning at Thompson Road Church of Christ. We're glad that you are here with us this morning. If you're visiting with us, we extend a special welcome to you. Uh, if you're watching us on live stream, we welcome you as well. And we'd love to get to know you and, uh, and help you, pray with you and for you if we can. Uh, George Dempsey's here this morning. I'm just so excited about that. Our brother's been away for a long time. And he said he's been waiting for this day for a long time. And so have we, George, so we're glad you're well enough to get back out. We'll talk about some prayer requests later, uh, but as we begin this morning, we'll come together and sing uh, praises to our God, and uh, Tom Beal, at the appropriate time, will uh, take our minds through uh, communion this morning, but as we begin, uh, our brother Ken Pollard will lead us in prayer. It is good to be here, and uh, I know God is with us, so let's talk to him. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for what you've given each one of us. You allow us to have your spirit within our hearts to guide us, to correct us, to be with us in many other gifts you bring our way, such as this body of Christ here that worships you steadfastly and that, that has joy when we come together. These are all good things, and we thank you for them. We look at our list of sick, and we see many of our loved ones, even here, who are stricken by ill health of one nature or, or the other. And we know, Father, that you are the great physician and Father we know that you know each one by their name and we pray that what is in your will for each one uh, takes place and we we would like to see healing when you choose to do so We thank you for the life you've given us. We thank you for the families that you allow us to have. And we thank you for the ministry here and for our minister who uh, uh, presents your word in a very good way such that each one of us wants to 
get every word that he says, even his humor, which is a pleasure to hear. And we ask, Father, that uh, as we come, come to you, that you recognize Thomaston Road Church of Christ as one of your bodies in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to get our song service started today. We're going to sing Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. We're doing sign language that everybody recognizes at this point. <laughs> Would you please stand with me for our opening song? <laughs> Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the soldier of the cross. With heart and royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is glory.
this thing we will glorify next. And uh, I'm going to ask everybody to pay very close attention because we're going to change the key. I'm just not going to tell you where. <laughs> we will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify sing one more song before the Lord's Supper, if that isn't love. <clears throat> he left the splendor Passover has been celebrated by the Jews for generations. It served as a remembrance of death, passing over the houses whose 
door frames were covered with the blood of a slain lamb. During this feast, Jesus instituted what we call the Lord's Supper. He, just, he told his disciples about the meaning of the bread and the cup, and he told them that as often as you partake of this, to do it in remembrance of me. You see, it was only a few hours until Jesus would be slain. He was the Lamb of God. He was the true Lamb of God, the true Passover Lamb. Because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, eternal death passes over all of us who have been covered by the Lamb's blood. Just as the Jews remembered the Passover, through a special feast, Jesus wanted us to remember this through a special feast that we call the Lord's Supper. So as his disciples, we continue each Lord's Day to remember him until he comes again. Go ahead and get out your bread, and as we prepare to partake it, we're going to go to the Father in prayer. Our most wise and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Jesus Christ. We are so thankful, Father, for him coming to this earth and giving himself as the perfect sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God. Father, we are so thankful for this bread, which to us is his body. As we partake of it, Father, may we remember him in the many different ways that each of us have to bring back things that he taught us and things that he showed us in his life. Thank you so much, Father, for this great gift of salvation that we have through him. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Father, we are also thankful for this cup, which represents the new covenant in Christ's blood. Father, we are so thankful that you gave us a new covenant. We're so thankful that through it and because of your son that, and the shedding of his blood that we can have eternal life. Father, we sometimes don't comprehend or don't understand the total significance of what took place there. Father, help us to, to think on it. Help us to realize, Father, that it is because of Christ that we have an opportunity to spend eternity in heaven. Thank you so much, Father, for the many promises that are given to us. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness in all of those things. And Father, thank you for this cup. And as we partake of it, may we do so in remembrance of our Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We also have an opportunity to worship with giving as a part of our worship. We've all heard of the scripture, John 3.16. That passage begins with these words. God so loved the world that he gave. Think about that. He so loved the world that he gave. This passage of scripture is a deep revelation of the heart of God. There's one thing the New Testament teaches us is that God is love and that 
Those of us who believe in him should love one another as he has loved us. This message in John 3.16 is that God is love, but love gives. Do you love God? True giving is from the heart. It creates an intimacy with God that becomes worship. So as we worship through giving, let us go to the Father in prayer. Father, you are our creator. You are the giver, the sustainer of life. And it's in you that we live and move and have our very being. It's from you that <clears throat> all blessings flow <clears throat> as part of our worship to you. <clears throat> we return a portion of those things you've freely bestowed upon us. And as we do so, may it be with a cheerful heart. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Yes, I believe God is real. Please stand with me for this song as well.
Good morning. <clears throat> this morning, the scripture reading will come from Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. <clears throat> Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Good morning. So since being here, I've not been used to the idea of having a scripture read before the sermon. It's a good idea, obviously. Um, but a game that I want to play with, I guess, myself nowadays, is give you a verse and then go to the actual text and figure out how we can connect those two dots. And so after reading Acts chapter 11, let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter 31. I'm the only one that finds that humorous, and that's fine, but I mean, you know, my sense of humor is twisted anyway, so might as well just let you know what I think that's hilarious. So from Acts 11 to Exodus 31. <clears throat> this morning, the overall theme I want to try to emphasize is the idea of stewardship. And biblically, we use that word quite often, but just practically in daily life, I had no idea what that word meant when I first heard it. I said, steward, like, steward? Like, no, not a proper name. A steward is someone who's in charge of something else that belongs to that person. And so, we, as Christians, are stewards of many things on behalf of God, and that is a huge responsibility. I don't know if you've ever had the situation where you had a, a parent, when you were a child, give you something that you were to hold on to or watch for a little while. If the person came back and you were not on top of where that item was, there were consequences. I remember one time, my father said, I'm gonna leave my wallet and my checkbook right here in the truck with you when I come back it shouldn't be moved. First thing he did was get out of the truck. First thing I had to do was figure out why I couldn't open that wallet. And I found out pretty quick. He was watching me through the glass to see what I would do. And so in that little illustration, we get the idea that someone who has great authority gives us something in our charge to watch or to protect or to utilize or use for that person's benefit. And when it comes to the idea of God giving us certain things that we are to watch or to protect or to use, uh, we can talk about financial wealth. Uh, we are people that live in this world in which finances are a part of our economy, a part of our social life. I'm sure many of you are going to eat sometime after I'm done talking up here. So when it comes to that, usually you pay for it. If you don't pay for it, you pay for the ingredients and you cook it yourself, right? And so the idea of using money is not one of those things that we're not unfamiliar with, but the money that we get from the jobs that we have uh, is a blessing ultimately from God. All things go back to Him, ultimately. All those good and perfect things come down from above from the Father of lights, right? And so when it comes to our finances, that's one area that's pretty obvious to kind of see what your budget is and therefore how we are using the funds that God gives us. But there's also other things in our life that God gives us that we maybe don't recognize really come from him. And so what I want to do is talk about a guy that I've never preached about before because his name is really hard to pronounce. There's a couple of those guys in Scripture. Let's go to Exodus chapter 31. Now, Exodus 31, if you have a, an image in your mind of what we're looking at here in the text, it's easy to kind of... Imagine the book of Exodus, like verses, uh, chapters 1 through 20, and then 20 through the rest of it, right? It's kind of the easy way to break it down. And so if you get past chapter 20, you've now gone past kind of the Exodus story, the formation of Moses becoming the kind of man that God needed him to be, to be Moses for those people. You have the Red Sea crossing, you have them coming to the mountain, and you really get towards the more meaty and important parts of the law of Moses or the covenant that God made with the Israelites 
through the person of Moses being the mediator. So when you get past 20, now we're getting down to the more regulation portion of it, really. There's some good chunks in there for us to kind of pull stories out of, but some of it gets a bit tedious to read, especially publicly in this kind of format. So verses 1 through 11 will be our block of text to begin with this morning. Exodus 31, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, and so now we have this conversation taking place on the mountaintop. You have Moses, you have God, and they're communicating, and he's saying what the agreements of the covenant are going to be. And here is a portion of that. Verse 2. See, I have called by name Beziel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence with knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze and cutting stones for setting and then carving wood to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Oliab, the son of Azimach, there we go, that's that name, of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. Let's just pause right there. It's an interesting little text because we're told what the specifications are exactly for the Ark of the Covenant and for all the other instruments of worship that were present within the tabernacle, including the tabernacle or the tent of meeting itself. And so back in the day, in the Israelite times, if you were to approach God or the place of God, we're not talking about going to him through prayer. We're not mentioning going before any kind of real uh, minister or prophet. We're talking about going before the tabernacle. So the word tabernacle simply means tent. It's a fancy word for it. And so they were to craft a very special, ornate, and costly tent for the place of God. You have the outer poles in which you would have the tent itself. You would proceed within to the holy place where you'd have all these instruments. And each one of those pieces of furniture or instruments would be a reflection, a very particular portion of God's revelation to the Israelites. The showbread, and you have the incense, and you have the lampstands, all these different items that would represent something very specific and was very precious to God. And then once a year, you would have the high priest and him alone go beyond a curtain within that tent with a sacrifice of a bull and bring that blood into the holiest of holy places within that tabernacle. And in there would be the ark, which is a very fancy word for a gold box. You would move that gold box with poles that were crafted to move that gold box. Within the box itself, you would have... Later on, the Ten Commandments, one jar or pot of manna they ate in the wilderness. And you would have Aaron's rod that was budded to show that Aaron was the first high priest. Now, on top of the ark or the box, you'd have a seat. This was called the mercy seat. And this is a place where, in a figurative sense, and more of a, a literal sense and a spiritual way, if that makes any sense, Uh, you'd have the mercy seat, the resting place of God's mercy on top of that ark. And that would be a sign and a tribute and a way to approach God, literally, within that tabernacle. But to make that tabernacle, it couldn't just be anyone who was good working with wood and with stones and with gold. Specifically, in verse 2 again, Beziel was the individual that was blessed by God with the ability to craft this tabernacle. So specifically him, not just anyone, but him. If you read back into the text once again, there's something kind of interesting here that I've missed a lot when reading this text. In verse 3 of Exodus 31, I have filled him with the Spirit of God. He is someone that we might call inspired. He has the Holy Spirit within him, And we would assume guiding him through this process. But if you keep reading, with ability, so I've filled him with the Spirit, I've filled him with ability and intelligence, with all knowledge and all craftsmanship. 
to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, bronze, and cutting stones for setting, and carving wood, and to work in every craft. And so when you read all that as one big block, it seems to imply that before he was filled with the Spirit of God, he was not as skilled in those areas. But I wonder if that's the case. I'd love to have a verse that proves it beyond any shadow of any doubt in my mind, but I wonder if he was just a naturally crafty person anyway. But to build the specific specifications of the tabernacle of God gave him an extra bit of ability. But whatever the case, this was the individual designed to be the designer and builder of the tabernacle of God and all the accompanying furniture pieces that went along with it. So stepping back to our original premise here, if you're, you are Beziel, the individual here blessed with this ability, with this gift, with this knowledge, you are a steward of those gifts, of those abilities, of what you can produce with your hands to allow the Israelites to approach you before the tabernacle of God, before the very mercy seat of God, and you are responsible to use that skill to help the people. So if you're the individual called out here by God through Moses, you know that your name is up there. You know that you are responsible because God has given you those things to build the tabernacle. You know what your requirements are. Does that make sense to you? Now, using that, let's keep reading here in the text. He's got some help, verse 6 and following. Let's jump back to verse 7. The things that he's going to build. The tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, in the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furnishings of the tent the table and its utensils, the pure lampstand with all its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin and its stand, and the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons for their service as priest, and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place. According to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. So they are now responsible to build the things that God was going to be using as images for how he reveals himself to the Israelites and later as an image for us in a spiritual way. And so we see pretty clearly and hopefully uh, concisely that this individual was blessed by God with certain abilities. And he knew that he was supposed to use those abilities for the betterment of the covenant between the Israelites and God. Make sense? Well, that's all well and good. But if you read a little bit further, let's go to Exodus chapter 32. Again, the stage is set. Moses has left the people. He's gone to commune with God on top of the mountain. God is displaying to him what the covenant with the people will be. The people, meanwhile, are left on their own at the foot of the mountain, and they're getting a little bored. In Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 1, right after God said, I've got a guy, I've given him the ability to make all these things, to make our relationship work, chapter 32, verse 1, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered together themselves to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who will stand before us. And as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. (sighs) What? (laughs) Here are the people, again, in slavery in Egypt. Moses comes and said, The great I Am has sent me to you, and to show Pharaoh certain signs, and you're going to be set free from this captivity. Long story short, it works. The people pack up, they leave, they go through the middle of the Red Sea without getting wet. They get finally to the foot of Mount Oreb. Moses goes up to commune with God. The people are so fickle, they say, I mean, can we just make our own gods? Have you learned nothing is the main point, right? Let's keep reading here. Aaron said to them, man, Moses is all right. 
He's up there talking with God, and he'd be right back. Don't worry about it. Not quite. Aaron says, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. If you're looking for biblical authority for a man to have an earring, by the way, here it is. I'm not sure who needs to hear that. I'm not saying I won't make fun of you for it, but it's biblically approved. Verse 4, And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. Who is the individual wielding the graving tool here? Not our guy. It seems to be Aaron, which is interesting. And he said... These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. By the way, in your English, you might have capital but lowercase uh, font here, L-O-R-D, which is the English way of indicating he used the proper name of Jehovah God in this instance. Aaron. It's not a great start, buddy. These are your gods, plural, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt, and we're going to celebrate the great I am in this way. Not great. They rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. I'm not going to explain that if you don't know what it is. You might want to do your own outside research for that one. All right. So we have an individual that's being talked about on the mountain with Moses. We've got a guy who's got the Holy Spirit in him, who has the ability, has the skill to make all the things necessary for the people to have a covenant relationship with Jehovah God. At the exact same time, it seems, you've got Aaron his brother down there, making an idol for them to worship in an unapproved way. The contrast here is stark. Now, I'll fast forward a bit. Moses gets told pretty quickly, you should go back home real quick and see what's going on. Moses comes down from the mountain, sees what the people are doing, thinking a war is going on, but instead they're all worshiping, we would say, in an inappropriate way. Moses is so furious, he breaks the tablets of God that God wrote, so-called Ten Commandments. uh, Moses, rather, grinds up this golden calf, mixes it with water, and makes the people drink it. You might say he's not too happy with the people, right? So, again, staying back from the text, we have this relationship with God described here where he is reaching down from heaven trying to be their God and he wants them to be his people but they're rebellious and they're hard-headed and they're stiff-necked and they're not picking up the message. If we drop down to Exodus chapter 36, let's go there together. In verse 1, things seem to be looking up. (laughs) Beziel and Oliab and every craftsman in whom the Lord had put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all the Lord has commanded. So now we've moved on past the golden calf. The covenant still stands. And these two individuals are now being looked at as the leaders of construction. Verse 2, And Moses called Beziel and Oliab, and every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him to come to do the work. Seems a little bit different though, doesn't it? Seems like we have the two guys in which the Lord has blessed them with an ability or a skill to build these things. We've also got folks stepping up to help whose heart was stirred to do the work. Seems like volunteers to me. Now, being one day away from Camp Canaan, I have a special place in my heart for people whose heart are stirred to help do the work. You know who you are. If you don't, I'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) 
Moving on to verse 3. And they received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work of the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning. So that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came, each from the task that he was doing, and said to Moses, The people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. What a great problem to have. I've yet to turn away a volunteer for helping with camp, by the way. But when it comes to the Israelites beginning their covenant with God, and they brought those things from their neighbors that they borrowed from Egypt, when they got to the mountain, they made the covenant relationship, and God says, here's what we need resource-wise to be able to make all this stuff. And by the way, there's a lot of gold talked about here there in that text. We need you to contribute because we're in the middle of nowhere. There's no mines around us. So we need you out of your own free will to offer up these precious things to make this, these furniture pieces by which God will be with us in our camp and in our land. We need you to step up and offer what you want to offer to be able to, to contribute to this effort. And by the way, that's God's most favorite way of getting people to contribute when it comes to monetary things, towards his kingdom and for his cause. He doesn't want you to be begrudgingly giving. He doesn't want you to feel like you're under necessity. He wants you to be willing to freely offer these things to the guy who gave it to you in the first place. Right? So the people are turning up every single day and offering these things to the cause and it's so overwhelming, all the workers stop their work and they go to Moses and says, we've got more than enough to meet the requirements of what God wants from us. So what does Moses do? Verse 6, Moses gave command and word was proclaimed throughout the camp, let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing it. Now, in the English there, it looks a bit harsh. They weren't literally restraining them from stopping to run to the altar, right? But the idea was, stop it. We've got enough. We're overflowing with material. You've done more than God had required. Again, a wonderful problem to have. Again, yet, yet have I to say to anyone, you know what? Don't even bother talking about camp. We are so covered, we're good to go. Instead, I say, we'll make it work, <laughs> right? So again, a great problem to have. That's in contrast to them so being so freely willing to offer up their earrings to make a golden calf just six chapters ago, or four chapters ago. And now that they've got their mindset correct about who Jehovah God is, they couldn't stop themselves from giving to what God needed to make that dynamic, that relationship, that covenant work. Again, that's the kind of people we're talking about here in the text. They're still the people who are hard-headed and stubborn and full of complaints and murmurings and trying to get Moses kicked off the team, but they were still eager to give towards what God needed to make that dynamic work. If you keep reading all of Exodus 36, 37, and 38, you have the details, which I'm not going to belabor you with this morning of how all those things were constructed, how long they were, how they were fashioned, what they looked like. Good details to have because it shows it's an actual thing, not just a fairy tale, right? But again, every time you read it, you're talking about, and he made, and he crafted, and he made. And the he there is the guy that God chose to have all the abilities and skill to craft those items. I've never picked that up before. I just read it and assumed the he was Moses. He just commanded it, and therefore it was done. No, it's the guy God chose to be the one to have the abilities that God blessed him with, and he was responsible for that work. In other words, he was a wonderful steward of the talents and the blessings from God. He did what God required of him. You with me? All right. Interestingly, we go to the New Testament. We're creeping our way towards Acts. 
Again, I mentioned how God has always preferred the idea of a free will offering. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Anyone want to guess what verse? No one's brave enough? Not even Lisa? Okay, verse 42. Acts 2, 42. This is the day of Pentecost for the Jewish feast day. 50 days after the Passover. Folks coming in from all over the place to come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. It's a great time for the gospel to be preached. Guess what? It was. The people that heard it, they responded pretty well overall, and they became Christians. So now you've got this new infantile group of Christians in Jerusalem, and no one's really from there. They're all just visiting from out of town, and here they are converted, and they want to stay. One small problem. They don't have jobs there in Jerusalem. They don't have property there in Jerusalem. They're expecting one another to help one another here in this situation. Guess what happens? Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. So to break that down, whatever the apostles taught, they were attentive. They wanted to learn more about this good news. The fellowship, the uh, camaraderie, uh, camaraderie, the idea of being all one in Christ, all related through the Savior, to the idea of breaking of bread, not just meals, but also, more importantly, probably the Lord's Supper and its import, uh, importance to remember the body and the blood that was sacrificed, and the prayers, how to communicate with God through the mediator of Jesus and the help of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 43, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. The confirmation of their faith and their belief was God was working in a, a miraculous way to prove that what was being said was accurate. Verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Another way to say that is they shared all that they had. Verse 45. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I would love, again, to just have a five-second video on my phone of what that looked like. Just an idea of what the energy was like in Jerusalem. They all came there because it's a feast day. If you're Jewish, you go to Jerusalem, celebrate Pentecost. And then they all heard the gospel. They were all astonished. They were full of faith. They obeyed the gospel, and they all just stayed there. If anyone had a physical or financial need, you had other church members just selling their stuff left, right, and center to be able to cover that person's needs. That kind of energy is contagious. I don't know how many times I've been out to a meal with someone, and we sit there and I order chicken when I want steak. If I want steak, I really want filet mignon, just to be honest with you. And then the bill comes, and I grab my wallet, and they say, oh, it's already paid for. I thought, well, if I would have known that, we've got a filet mignon all, all the way through. <laughs> sorry, Ted, I, I did it to Ted because I knew he was paying, so I'm sorry, Ted. But that feeling of, you know what, that, that person has blessed me with this meal. I didn't have to do anything to have this meal paid for. Ultimately, God blessed me through that person to have this meal. That's a small little thing. It's one meal of your life. I mean, how many meals do you have? Probably more than one, right? The whole idea of that little moment, that person made something, gave something away that they worked hard for to help you in this one little moment. That was the feeling every meal because these folks were from out of town. They didn't have the budget to go and have a meal for two or three years. So when they would go to a meal and break bread with people, they're like, what a great blessing this is. You guys sacrificed so that we could all enjoy this together. Thank you. That's the, 
thing that brothers and sisters do for one another, right? And they were feeling it there in that first century. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Got to pick up my pace a bit. Acts 4. That's my boy out there screaming. Verse 32. (laughs) Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Man. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. I had an instructor at one point who decided to teach us all a lesson. It stuck with me, though, so I guess it worked. He said, "Uh, Brother so and so, hand me your wallet. And he reached into his back pocket and pulled his wallet. He goes, No, hand me your wallet. And so he's like, I got my wallet. That's not your wallet. And we're all like, what is in the world is going on? Extortion, a bribe for a good, better grade? What is happening? And he goes, I want you to never forget that piece of leather you have in your back pocket full of cash and credit cards and debit cards isn't yours. God gave it to you. So what you do with it matters. Memorize all the serial numbers on every single bill you own because God's going to ask you to give account for it one day. What did you do with the wealth that I gave you? It's a bit harsh when said that way, but that's the reality. In in the first century, they knew it, and they felt it, and they lived it. They had all things in common. The stuff I have isn't my stuff. I'm just taking care of it for God and for somebody else. Verse 33 And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds to that which was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was given out as anyone had need. And thus, a guy named Joseph, who was given the name Barnabas by the apostles, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a Cyprus native, sold a field that belonged to him, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. That's the introduction to the great Barnabas of our New Testament, by the way. He saw what was happening, and it was so contagious, he couldn't help but sell his property and give in. Now over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, let's turn there together. What 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4 is, is not necessarily, you listening? It's important I say it correctly. I might mess it up. It is not necessarily a command written to you and me. Do you understand that? Sometimes I've been read 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 as if I was the person discussed in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. One small problem, I don't live in Corinth and I'm not of the first century. However, the principle in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, but more importantly in 2 Corinthians 8, does apply to me. Let's read it together. Paul writes to the first century Corinthians... Now concerning the collection for the saints, the saints being those who are sanctified or those who are in Christ. So they already knew there was some kind of collection taking place by the hands of Paul and Barnabas for the needs of the saints, specifically in Jerusalem. And here's the directive. As I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. So he goes, Corinthian guys, I know you know about the collection that I'm getting together for the saints in Jerusalem. Here's how I want you to do it, just like how I told the Galatian church to do it. Verse 2, on the first day of every week, now we can put in huge parenthetical marks here, when you guys are already assembling for worship, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. And that's the key, I think, for me in this case. Have you prospered financially this week? If you haven't, you may not have much to to contribute (laughs) financially. If you have prospered this week, Paul says the thing to do is to lay it aside, store it up. Why? 
so that there will be no collecting when I come. Paul says, when I come through Corinth, I'm not going to have the ability to go from house to house to house to house to be able to collect the funds that you guys want to contribute towards the saints who are suffering in Jerusalem. So when I stop by, have a check ready, in other words. Have it all laid up in one area that I can just grab it and send it to the folks who are in need. And um, let's go to Acts chapter 11, just for sake of tying it all together. After this, I have one more verse. Acts 11, verse 27. What was the need that Paul was trying to fill? Well, contextually, from Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 27. Now in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Technically, Antioch, in this case, is going north, but you're coming down from the mountain of Jerusalem, right? So verse 28 And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. And Luke says, this took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, each one according to his ability, he might even say the word according to his prosperity, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. Then here's the kicker, verse 30, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Saul meaning Paul. So when Paul said to the Corinthian congregation in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, listen, you guys know about the collection that I'm taking up for all the Christians in Judea. When I come through, make sure you have it ready every first day of the week, assemble it, and I will pick it up and send it to the elders that they can take care of that need. That's the New Testament authorized and approved way to fund something. I love car washes. I love fundraisers. I love chocolate bars. But when it comes to the kingdom and how we fund the work that we do in his name, the money in our wallet, the account in our bank account, that's not ours. God gave it to us. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to use those things that he's given us to glorify his name. But when it comes to the identity, we're just stewards of those things. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Have you ever thought about why in the world taking up money on the first day of the week is an act of worship? I had a really hard time with that. God was told, act of worship, you get five of those. Plan of salvation, you get five plus one right? So why is giving money an act of worship? I really didn't think it was. I said, you know what? I think that's just made up. And then someone said, have you ever read 2 Corinthians? I go, nope. And they go, well, go to chapter 8 and chapter 9. In chapter 8, verse 1, Paul, writing to the Corinthian congregation that had a collection every first day of the week for Paul to take up, He says, I want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that's been given among the churches of Macedonia, the northern part of of, uh, Greece. Because in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. What Paul's doing here is a political move, if I've ever seen one. He's saying, look, I want you to know that you know how hard it's been in Macedonia for our brethren, how poor they are, how afflicted they are with temptation, with trials, and with persecution. Even through all of that, they've been able to contribute financially. It's been a great blessing from God. Verse 3, because they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Paul's kind of slyly hitting the fact, hey, you guys in Corinth, you don't have it as bad as those in Macedonia. And even though they've got it pretty bad, they loved to be a part of helping the Christians who had a need. The same kind of communal spirit that was present in Jerusalem was still, in a way, present, even spread out through the ancient Roman Empire. You got people in Macedonia who are not even Jews, they're Gentiles, but now they're Christians. 
And they love the Christians in Jerusalem and Judea so much, they're willing out of their poverty to give towards those needs. Let's keep reading. And here's the key. Verse 5. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Folks, if God wanted just money from you, he would have given you a commandment. What's the percentage? How much do you make a week? I want a tenth of that. I want a fifth of that. I want half of that. This is not tax that we're paying every first day of the week. This is not the IRS. Thank God for that. (laughs) God says, I made everything by speaking it into existence. If you think I have a need to command you of how much to give, that's not what we're doing here. He told his people at the foot of Mount Sinai, there is a need to build these things. The people stepped up after making mistake after mistake after mistake, and there was so much given towards God's need that showed their heart they had to restrain them from coming and giving anymore. First century church, there was a financial need. They saw the people that were there. They couldn't afford to eat. So what did they do? They were happy to share with what they had to those that were in need. Paul and Barnabas are out there. There's a great famine going on. The brethren in Judea are starving to death, and they're going around saying, you know what we can do? I know you can't do a whole lot here by yourselves, but what you can do is give yourselves to the Lord, recognize that you are a servant of the Most High God, and then give back what you can. Accordingly, we urged Titus, as he had started, so that he should uh, complete among you this act of grace. Meaning, this act of grace, of being able to give to those that are in need to make the work of the kingdom go forward, we told Titus to tell you, do the same thing. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in earnestness, in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Grace is sometimes defined as unmerited favor. Do we deserve the wealth that we have? Do we deserve the blessings that we receive? Do we deserve the skills and abilities and talents that God gave us? By no means. By no means. So why is giving back to God of our abilities and our talents and the wealth that he gave us, an act of worship, because it's a grace that we didn't deserve. But God gave it to us anyway. And what he wants from us is not just a check. It's not about that. I don't know how many times, personally, I've been criticized because I don't place a check in the plate when we used to pass it every single week. I get paid every uh, two weeks. Have I prospered the week I don't get paid? Personally, I don't think so. It's for you to decide, I suppose. But personally, I don't think so. I have a budget. And I have 1st of the month, 15th of the month. And I had a person one time say, I understand what you're saying, but couldn't you just take that amount and divide it by two and put a check in on every week of the amount that you would? I go, yeah, if I want to show off to you. That was my statement. We were friends, so I could say that kind of stuff. I said, yeah, it's not about me just showing it to you. It's about God knowing, hey, you're a part of my life. All I have is from you anyway. I'm happy to give this back to your work. And when I get it, you'll get it right back. So the idea of God blessing us with abilities and talents and even our wealth is a huge aspect of Scripture. Because where your treasure is, Jesus said, There your heart will be also. If we live like God is our treasure, we are beyond wealthy. But if our treasure is somewhere in there, keeping a little bit back because we're not sure God can come through next week, next two weeks, next three weeks, something may be a bit off about the way that we 
think about our Creator and how much He he loves us. So folks, the lesson is yours this morning. This is a reminder, not just for you, but for me. If you're ever wondering why I preach what I preach, it's not because you need it. I don't know you well enough. I preach it because I know I'm thinking about those things and they're bothering me and I want a refresher. The things that I thought I, I knew and had under control, but it reminds me of important illustrations and lessons from the Word of God. The most important act of grace is not just what we receive from the Lord, but the, act, the idea of receiving grace from His Son's sacrifice. This morning, if anyone is outside of Christ, why not be a part of the family that loves you so much we are willing to sacrifice anything we have to make sure your needs are met, to serve you with the abilities that God gave us, and to be there for you. If you are a Christian, but you've not been a part of the fold, you feel left out or outside of that body of believers because sin is in your life, all it takes is simple, humble repentance and encouragement from your brethren here, your family here, to be restored by a prayer of repentance. If anyone has a need to respond to the invitation of our Lord, please do so now. We stand and we say. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned and clean. How marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my soul shall knocking on our door. Thanks, Alan. Let us bow our heads. Dear Father, we're so thankful. Yes, that word, thankful. We use that so frequently throughout the uh, the service. But Father, we are thankful. We're a blessed nation so rich by comparison when even our poorest are richer than the majority of the poor in the world. Father, I want to thank all the volunteerism that I see happening as we prepare for Camp Canaan. I'm thankful that these people are these brothers and sisters are willing to step forward and spend more of their time to accomplish the task of helping these campers have a good time and learn about your word. And I want to thank you for the ability that we have to come to you in prayer asking for the things that we each need. And we all know that we're deficient. We have needs that are, well, we have abilities, but we sometimes subdue them. We don't let them shine like they should be. 
Father, I pray that you give us the strength to use our abilities and allow ourselves to learn more abilities. And we can be of service to you, Father. Sometimes it's hard to realize what our purpose in life is, but it is simply being your servant. Take the me out of I and myself and remember that I need this, this going forwardness, this helping neighbors, others that we come in contact with to learn about you so that they can also have the wonder of a friend that can be there all the time. And it's always great to see each of us here. Thank you again, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.